kind of weird. Guys, if you got questions, just go ahead and post them, and I'll get to them after um, after the topic of the stream. Uh, what did I call this? Oh, tips for hard gainers. So today we're going to talk about tips for hard gainers. I'm going to give a couple minutes because I started a little early. A couple minutes to get people in here. Um, so, I mean, you know, if you guys follow me on Instagram, by the way, my Instagram is underscore J underscore Vincent couple days a week, I will post the option for you to ask me a question through the Instagram story, and I will answer them as long as they're not completely ridiculous, which some of them are. So, you know, quite a few questions I get are from hard gainers. A lot of people who are having a hard time not only just putting on muscle, but putting on anything. So in my Patreon, um, my Patreon page I posted a video on nutrition advice for the hard gainer. I also put this video on um, the home workout. So you guys can see right here the link. That's the link to the high intensity training home workout. And what I've decided to do with this workout is consistently update it over time. So if you if you buy this home workout, there will be just like, you know, video games, there's going to be updates to the workout. I'm going to add content to the workout if you already purchased it. So tonight I just, uh, I added four or five additional videos to this workout and those who bought it automatically get sent a link with the updated video. So, you know, if you buy this video, you're, you're not, if you buy this, uh, hit home workout, you're going to get updated content sent automatically to you in the future. And I already did that. I sent uh, the four or five new videos I, I created to that. So I'm going to put up, you know, a bunch of, I'm just going to keep updating the thing. So if you get the high intensity training home workout, you're getting updates down the road too for things. I think that, you know, I might want to add to it. So I already sent that, <clears throat> that update as well. Um, yeah, so on my Patreon, here's here's the link to my Patreon page, by the way. Patreon, oh wait, yeah, patreon.com forward slash J Vincent. So if you guys haven't joined my Patreon yet, https dot dot slash www dot patreon.com forward slash J Vincent. So if you guys haven't joined the Patreon yet, that's the link to the Patreon. Um, just put a video up, you know, about a 15-minute video on nutrition tips for hard gainers, which I'm going to go over briefly tonight, um, but I went way more in-depth on Patreon. I even kind of gave an example of the meal. I posted a picture of the meal I like to, to use <clears throat> for hard gainers. And um, I think tomorrow I'm going to actually go through and cook a hard gainer meal for you. I think I, I did another hard gainer breakfast. I did a, I filmed um, cooking a hard gainer breakfast on the Patreon, and I'm also going to film a hard gainer lunch, dinner, whatever. <clears throat> I decided since a lot of people are really confused on nutrition, I'm, I'm going to, on the Patreon, I'm going to actually cook meals and show you how the hell to do it. <laughs> I mean, I, I I really can't hold your hand anymore <laughs> than I'm doing now. But I'm gonna, I'll set up the camera in the kitchen and film how to make the damn meal. I'm not Bobby Flay or Gordon fucking Ramsay by any means, but I'll do it. I'll do it for you. 
because I feel like a large percentage of, of you, even if you're young, especially if you're younger guys, probably don't cook that much. So I'm going to kind of show you how I do it. It's pretty easy, actually. And it comes out really good. So um, let's see. Uh, all right. So before I go through the questions, I'm going to go over, over you know, a couple of tips for the hard gainers. Um, so if you want in-depth nutrition tips for the hard gainer, um, the video is available in this workout plan. For those of you who already bought the workout plan, look in your email for the updated workout plan because it's going to contain a video in depth on the topic I'm talking about now if you already purchased it. Um, and if you want to view the video, it's going to be in this workout plan amongst other videos. So before I get into the questions, let's talk about tips for the hard gainer. So what is a hard gainer? A hard gainer, I was a hard gainer once, but <laughs> looking back, I was 15 years old. So it was six, 15, 16 years old. So it was pretty friggin' normal. Keep in mind, you know, I get some people who ask me who are 15, 16, 17 years old and they're having a hard time putting on muscle. Here's the thing. You're too young. You're going to see your, be your best body composition is probably going to be anywhere from 25 to 35 to maybe even late as 40. So if you're a hard gainer and you're under 20 years old, it's still really early. You're not going to have that physique for the rest of your life. Don't panic. It's very common to be a hard gainer young. I was a hard gainer once. You know, when I, I went into my senior year of high school at about 163 pounds. If you can imagine me at 163, yeah, I was thin. Um, and I graduated at 188. I've, I had been lifting weights since 16, but it took me to till I was about 18 years old to put on weight. Why? Well, hormones. You know, it took uh, until about 18 years old for everything hormonally to exhibit the masculine traits, you know, things like testosterone and all those other things and growth hormone it took me to about 18 years old to where those things were where they needed to be for me to grow muscle. So if you're a young dude and you're 14, 15, 16 years old and you're pissed off because you're not putting on muscle, well, you're not. I, I had been training since 15 years old. I didn't put on a lick of muscle till I, till I was 18. That's three years of training every single week, all the time for nothing. Got stronger, of course. But, um, you know, if you're young, it's going to take a while. No. So the hard gainer is, you know, a thin, a thin individual, skinny, not much fat, um, kind of lanky, skin and bones. You know, that's, that's the hard gainer. Someone who has a difficult time putting on mass in any form. You know, somebody who's, you know, maybe, you know, 5'10 to 6'0, 140, 145, 150. You know, that's a hard gainer. So what what are the tips for that? If you are a hard gainer, if you're a skinny dude and you're above 18 years old, because if you're skinny and below 18 years old, just give yourself time. You're gonna be fine. But if you're skinny and you're above 18 years old, what can you do to assist in putting on mass and you know, more specifically? lean muscle tissue. Well, first of all, you obviously have to eat. Let's we're assuming we're doing resistance training, right? We're assuming we're weight lifting weights. We're assuming we're doing it optimally by training to failure with a volume of frequency that we can and the as the individual recover from and adapt. Okay. We're already assuming we're lifting weights because that's going to put the stimulus on. So what do we do dietarily? You have to eat a lot. And, you know, a lot of the times, so you're a hard gainer. You're you're very unlikely to put on fat tissue, okay? Um, you are, you don't have many fat cells. Your fat metabolism is great. You're glucose sensitive. You're insulin sensitive. You're not going to put on fat tissue. In I've had, you know, parents and even younger guys tell me, or parents about their younger, you know, their sons, they eat everything and they don't gain weight. Well, the truth is they're not eating everything. Their, their, par their parents may think or they may think that they're eating a lot, but they're really not. They're really not. So the hard gainer is going to want a calorie surplus. And I'm not saying 
a thousand calories above resting metabolic rate, maybe just a couple hundred calorie surplus. Um, obviously, you want to hit your protein requirement. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna want about a gram of protein per pound of body weight, or two grams of protein per kilo of body weight. If you're a hard gainer, that pretty much goes for everybody who's relatively lean. <clears throat> so the hard gainer is gonna want a slight calorie surplus, hit the calories, and here's here's the weird part about a hard gainer that most people aren't are gonna be surprised to hear. The hard gainer should be eating a lot of carbohydrates. I know everybody's going to freak out and say carbs are bad, insulin this, leptin that, blah, 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 blah. Well, guess what? Insulin this, leptin that, ghrelin this, bullshit that, that only applies to the fatties, to the fat people. That applies to obese people. If you are obese, and, and very, very fat, very overweight, then yeah, you're going to want to pay a little more attention to, you know, the insulin, the insulinogenic response, the glycemic load, glycemic index, blah, 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 all that stuff. But if you're a hard gainer, you have that already taken care of. If you are a hard gainer, you want to eat a lot of carbohydrates. 60% of your calorie intake, probably. Um, Three, four, five hundred grams of carbs a day is what you're going to want to do. And here's why. So while protein does have a pretty strong anabolic response, stimulates anabolism, stimulates an anabolic response, aka tissue growth, so do carbs. Carbs have the insulin. Carbs stimulate insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1, which is an anabolic hormone produced in your body. Carbs do a great job at doing that. So hormonally, if you're skinny, carbs will help you hormonally become more anabolic. Also, physiologically, about 20% to 20 to 30%, yeah, about 20% of your muscle is made up of glycogen, which is the stored form of glucose. So you eat carbohydrates, it gets converted to glucose in your bloodstream. And then store it in your muscle tissue and your liver as glycogen. So if 20% of your muscle, 15, 20% of your muscle is made up of glycogen, which comes from glucose, which comes from carbohydrates, then if you are low on carbohydrates, your muscles are not going to be holding as much glycogen as they can, and you're going to appear smaller. This has nothing to do with sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. It just has to do with muscle glycogen. So if you are a hard gainer and you're skinny and you want to look bigger, eating a lot of carbs is going to make sure your glycogen stores are full and it's going to make you look fuller, make you look bigger. Okay. That is why carbs are, are great. And carbs are very calorie dense, very easy to get a lot of calories through carbs. So if you're a hard gainer, you need to uh, be eating, you know, a sufficient amount of calories. Eating a lot of carbs is a good way to get those calories in, all right? <clears throat> another another tip for hard gainers, you always want to be hydrated. You know, the, the thing is, whether they like to admit it or not, hard gainers, you know, skinny individuals, they don't eat much of anything or drink much of anything. They're, they normally don't drink much water and they don't eat, eat much food. They think they do, they might think they do, but they really don't. <clears throat> so water intake, you want to be relatively hydrated because here's the thing. About 75 to 76% of your muscle is um, water. So we got 20% carbs or 20% glycogen, 75% water. We're at 95%. Then the last 5% is, you know, contractile tissue and other tissues. <laughs> so there's very little actual contractile tissue in there. Mostly water and muscle glycogen. So if you're dehydrated, you're also going to look smaller. So if you're low on carbs and dehydrated, you're going to look as flat as you possibly can. And this is why, you know, super skinny people on the low carb diet, they're just going to look like shit. <laughs> you're going to look like, if you, if you are a skinny person, eat a lot of carbs, three, four, five, 600 grams a day. Then 
you know, anywhere between probably 140 to 200, well, 120 to 160 grams of protein a day. And then the rest with fat. All right. When it comes to training, if you're a hard gainer, there's really nothing different you want to do. You still want to train really, really intensely um, because that is the best way to get at the fast twitch motor units and the fast twitch motor units most fibers grow the most. The more intense you train, the more metabolic stress, the more mechanical tension, the more the overall growth stimulus. So there's really no different way to train if you're a hard gainer. No, you do not want to train more if you're a hard gainer, because if you can barely friggin' respond to exercise as it is, why would more exercise benefit you? If hard gainers respond poorly to resistance training exercise, why would they do more of a stress that they respond poorly to? Does that make sense? Opposite, okay? So just to recap quickly, tips for a hard gainer. One, get adequate protein, of course, about a gram per pound of body weight or two grams of car or two grams of protein per kilo of body weight. Two, eat a lot of carbohydrates. Three, four, five hundred grams of carbs per day, maybe about 50 to 60 percent of your daily calorie intake, carbohydrates. Three, stay hydrated. Since most of your muscles are made up of water, 75, 76 percent, you want to stay hydrated to make yourself look and feel fuller. Now, where to get the carbohydrates from? You want to try to get them from whole food sources. Um, sweet potatoes, vegetables, even white potatoes, things like squash, pretty much any kind of vegetable. Um, even, you know, white rice, brown rice, quinoa. Oatmeal's not bad. Ace, don't do that. Oatmeal's not bad. Um, but what you want to stay away from from our, you know, re refined carbohydrates because the way the body metabolizes them, it's just, it's just not going to work as well as whole natural food sources. So stay away from things like cereal and, you know, white bread, pop tarts, things with a ton of refined sugar in it. Stay away from those. So if you're eating a lot of carbs, you're going to probably want to stick to things like quinoa, white rice, brown rice, tons of vegetables. Um, Sweet potatoes, white potatoes, that sort of thing. And when I say white potatoes, I'm not talking about Orida frozen french fries. All right. I'm talking about like get the damn potato, peel it, cut it, mash it, whatever. <clears throat> so hard gainers, protein intake, lots of carbs, lots of water, and lots of rest. Um, the way you should train, no different really. Um Creatine might help you too, actually. So creatine for some people, about half of the population maybe, um, it will help your body hold water too, which will give you a bigger, fuller look. So about five grams of creatine per day every single day, that would help a heart gain or two. So if you guys have any any questions about what I just ranted on or rambled on, those are my tips for a heart gainer. Um, if you want... You know the uh, a little more detail on that it's included in my home workout which is a series of a bunch of videos home workout link is right there um updated even more content in there and as time goes on i'm going to be updating this product so i'm going to be adding material to the home workout the digital product so if you buy it when i update it it's just gonna automatically send you the new updated version all right so once you got that, you got all the new stuff coming with it too. So I'm going to go through um, a couple of the questions here. Um, again, don't you know? Couple of couple of rules for the questions. There are a couple of questions that drive me absolutely nuts, and I'm really tired of answering them. First of all, do not list your workout and ask me if it's effective. Don't do that. If you want to do that, hire me for coaching. Okay. If you want me to look at it one on one, go through it, pick it apart. Hire me for coaching. The email address at the bottom scrolling across. You can email me there. We can set up a private coaching call where we will dissect all your habits, including your workout, and come up with the most effective plan for you. But I'm not doing it here. Um, do not ask me about workout frequency. Do not ask me if one workout a week versus two versus three, which is more effective. I've answered that question 17,000 times in the past few months. Look at a video. You'll find the answer. 
Um, do not ask me stupid shit like what is the best approach for building muscle because that's what the whole goddamn channel is about. <clears throat> All right, just that. Just those those drive me crazy. See, water. I drink, I don't know, geez, six, seven, eight, nine of these a day. Always drink water. Again, you don't have to drink a freaking gallon of water like some people do. <clears throat> All right, first question. Have you hit your genetic peak by now muscle-wise? Are you just doing maintenance at this point? Yep. I, I mean, so it took me about the past three, four, three, four years to put on five pounds. <laughs> so I'm assuming I pretty much hit the peak. Um, I don't desire to be any bigger. I don't want to look weird. Um, basically, if I wanted to get to that ultra jacked, super gigantic physique, I'd have to just take a ton of steroids, which I have absolutely no reason to take steroids. Not a competitive bodybuilder. There's no reason. So I'm good here. Probably hit the genetic yeah, pretty much my genetic limit. But again, super hard, intense stress on the muscle is what got me to this point. So how am I going to maintain this? You need to continue. Very intense stress on the muscle. The only thing that might change is you might be able to get away with less frequency. But you can't just do easy workouts infrequently and expect to keep um, an unusual amount of muscle tissue. Again, I'm like, 210 to 215. Um, so yeah. You so when when you reach your you know when you when you reach your goal body composition, goal physique, whatever, you're gonna have to continue to implement and expose your body to the stimulus which caused it to adapt and change. It's just like you go out and you get a suntan. How do you keep the suntan? How often would you have to tan to keep the suntan? Probably twice a week, once, twice a week. It's the same thing. You got to have, you know, just enough to keep that adaptation. Uh, but you can't ignore it completely and expect it to stay. Are you able to add a lower back exercise to the home workout course? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Um, basically, what I recommend just for now Google uh, what's called the McKenzie. It's basically, it looks almost like a yoga move. You kind of just lay on your stomach and push yourself up and extend your back. Um, that's what I recommend at home. But there aren't really, with very limited equipment, there aren't any back exercises with added resistance that I would recommend. Only the McKenzie. But I can add that. How do I train neck? I don't give advice on neck training um, because uh, it's just I have never really focused or learned much about it because there are very few people who know much about it. And uh, it's kind of a liability. So I'm not going to recommend any exercises for somebody's neck because they'll likely hurt themselves. And I don't want to be responsible for that. So when it comes to neck training, um, I don't know. You could do a static neck extension, static neck flexion. You know, I'll add that to the home workout. I, I can do that because you, you probably won't get hurt doing that. So neck training, I'm gonna add that. Um, I'm gonna add that to this updated workout, which I'll I'll record tomorrow. Maybe Christmas. Maybe I'll give you guys a Christmas gift and upload it on Christmas. Um, I'll add things like neck training, the McKenzie. I'll add them to the, the at-home workout. I don't really recommend neck training other than static contraction, which is going to be basically you're going to be pushing your head against an immovable object for enough time to where your neck flexors get um, tired. But briefly, that's that's what I would do. I'll add it to the thing. <clears throat> All right, here we go. Is how big someone's baseline muscle mass untrained a clear indicator of how buff they can get naturally at most? Or do some people grow muscle a lot more than expected by others? Yeah. Uh, so here's the thing. For those who can become like bodybuilder level, they're going to be very muscular before they ever start training. 
And if you've seen pictures of like Ronnie Coleman, if you've seen pictures of uh, Mike Menser when he was younger, it's, it's like his first training competition, like his first bodybuilding competition. These guys were very thick and muscular right before they, before they even started training. So that's bodybuilder level. Um, for someone who has an, like an above – so if someone has the ability to have a very aesthetic physique, they will already have an aesthetic physique before they start training. Like, for instance, myself as an example, you know, 15, 16, 17 years old, I wasn't big. You know, I was only, like I said, going into my senior high school, I was 163, and I graduated at about 188. I wasn't big, but I had extremely well-developed, defined muscles. Not big, but they looked noticeable to the point where, I tell the story all the time. I was 15 years old. No, no, no. 14. Uh, was I 13? Yeah, I was, I think I was 14, maybe 13, 14, or 15 years old. Young. All right. And I had broken my collarbone in football. And I went to the orthopedic office and I had to take my shirt off and have him check it. The doctor is going around. He turns around and he looks at my father, and goes, Your son looks like a middleweight. I was so muscular at 13, 14 years old already that the orthopedic surgeon, orthopedic doctor told my father I looked like a middleweight boxer. <laughs> so I never started training. So if you look, no, the, the, you, the likelihood, if, if you are likely to build a very aesthetic physique, you almost certainly will look very aesthetic before you ever start training. Like I did, like all these other bodybuilders did. If you have the ability to get gigantically jacked, you will be above, you know, pretty above average muscularity before you ever start working out. So, and that does not mean you don't have the ability to significantly change your appearance. It's just, you don't have the ability to look like, fitness model or bodybuilder or professional athlete. Otherwise you would make sense. Again, guys, the home workout link is right there. New updated videos on that. Everybody who purchased it, you've been sent the email link for the updated version. And I'm also adding uh, neck training and, lower back training to this home workout video as well. So if you haven't already, go ahead and pick that up. Uh, is there any advantage to getting your water intake in many small portions instead of chugging down one liter three times a day? Well, who said to chug down one liter three times a day? I, it does not matter how you get your water in at all. Do you see lower back exercise is completely useless for someone without back pain? No, no, not necessarily. Um, for somebody who is just embarking on an exercise journey, lower back exercises should be done. Um, again, I didn't put them in my home workout because, I mean, I have Nautilus and Med X lumbar extension machines <laughs> like i have the best of the best for training the lower back and i have my clients train their lower back once a week and this is because for people who you know haven't worked out either ever or in many many years their lower back is super atrophied so yes i would train this individual if it was a 17 year old athlete you know baseball player football player whatever maybe once every two weeks but the thing is, your lower back will strengthen if you are active and if you've been training or weightlifting or exercise. So if you're an individual who's been training for 20 years relatively consistently, it's not a big deal. Probably don't have to worry about your lower back unless you're doing like exercise of a shitty form. Um, there's nothing, there's no downside to training it, but I think it's not as necessary for some people as others like deconditioned people, old people, super important training the lower back because it's super deconditioned. People with back pain, obviously, lower back training gets rid of it. Um, like every single time I've noticed. <clears throat> All right, 
How much does alcohol consumption affect muscle building? A lot. So the problem with alcohol is that it's systemically inflammatory. Okay. It's bad to your body. It's essentially a poison. Um, the worst part about alcohol is that it dehydrates you. And it is extremely difficult to build muscle without proper hydration because muscle is 76% water. Um, if your cell membranes become dehydrated, their ability to um, interact, their receptors' ability to interact with particular hormones and enzymes isn't going to work as well. So the problem with alcohol is that it's dehydrating and inflammatory. So it, ex it affects muscle building a lot. And I'm talking about consistent consumption of alcohol. If you have one or two beers every night, <laughs> not going to affect it. But if you are, you know, if you are getting drunk a couple days a week, you're screwed. You're not going to see shit for gains. I mean, obviously there are going to be some people who do. I'm talking about the average individual. I mean, you know, Rob Gronkowski goes out and parties all the time. And, you know, but again, we're talking about normal individuals. <clears throat> I feel that shoulder press does not train the posterior part of the medial delt. Wow. Raises do. Um, so, okay. <laughs> no. So there's a posterior delt, a medial delt, and an anterior delt. There is no posterior part of the medial delt. The medial delt is just in the middle. Um, they all contract. It, pick your arm up. Do this. See what you feel. The front delt, it's contracted. It's just not hard, very hard. The rear delt, eh, it's kind of contracted. The medial delt's contracted very hard, okay? Now, take your arm and push against something, preferably something that doesn't move. Or you could just raise your arm like this. What do you feel? Feel the medial delt, very contracted. The front delt, very contracted. The rear delt, not so much. So what's this? Do this. Front delt, hard as a rock. Medial delt. Hard as a rock. Rear delt. Flaccid. Do this. Shoulder extension. Rear delt. Hard as a rock. So, how do we train the front and medial delt? Overhead press. Hard, hard, soft. How do we train the rear delt? Row. Shoulder extension. Just do it. Put, put your arm behind you. It's hard. That's it's it, that's a pretty easy way to identify which muscle is being worked. Just feel the um, feel the muscle tone, feel the muscle tension in particular movements. You know, front delt, even the front delt is going to work. The you know, doing a raise here is going to work the front and the medial very well. But if you shift over here, it's going to be a little more involvement of the medial. But any sort of raise is not going to work the posterior delt. That's not its function. The posterior delt's function is scapular retraction. Shoulder extension, like this. So any row or pulling movement is going to heavily involve the rear delt. I don't know why people obsess about the fucking rear delts and front delts so much. You know how small that muscle group is? If you're doing a push and a pull, you're going to hit them. You, don't need, you do not need to do specific exercises for the front and the rear delt. They're heavily worked. Any pushing and pulling movement. Overhead press is going to, it's going to get the medial in front as best as you can. And then everything from a, a rowing mo, uh, movement or shoulder extension, you're you're getting you're getting the rear delt. <clears throat> I seem to get more bulk from your workouts. No, no. Well, yeah, because the point of the workout is to add muscle tissue. No workout makes you cut and lean. That is not the byproduct of a workout. That is the byproduct of your diet. If you want more visible muscles, if you want to get leaner, you have to reduce your calories. There's no adjustment to any workout. This is just dumb shit that the fitness industry people believe. There's no workout which significantly reduces body fat levels. It's done through a negative energy balance, which is best, most effectively accomplished through calorie restriction. If variable resistance is good, why not resistance bands? Because resistance bands vary the resistance in the exact opposite of the strength curve of most muscle groups. So think of it this way. When you're doing a chest press, 
your muscles are weakest down here, strongest somewhere in the middle, and then it gets weaker again at the top. A resistance band adds the most resistance to near full extension where the triceps and the chest are weaker. So it's adding more resistance where the muscles at one of its weakest positions. Consider a row. You're doing a pull. Your muscles are weakest out here, and then they get weakest in the contracted. They go weak, strong, weak in the contracted position due to actinomycin overlap and changes in leverage. So the resistance band adds the most resistance in a weakest position of the range of motion. It's literally the exact fucking opposite. That's why resistance bands suck because <laughs> Nautilus varies the resistance according to the strength curve. The resistance band increases the resistance linearly while the strength curve. Oh, 20 bucks. Hold on one second. I'll show you. So I hate resistance bands because they're just douchey. They just, they're just really douchey. If you don't like the word douchey, whatever. But they are resistance bands are so douchey. So I don't know if you'll be able to see this coming out of the head. My head has disappeared miraculously. Mine. So Hang in there. What is wrong with this pen? This thing does not work at all. All right, let me try this. Try this again. So resistance band versus So if you look here, the problem with the resistance band is, come on, focus. This is the curve of the resistance band. It is linear. The resistance band provides more resistance the more you stretch it. The strength curve is a bell curve. Weak and full extension, strongest somewhere in the middle of the range of motion, and then weak again in the fully contracted position. So if you're using a resistance band, you're challenging the muscle the most in the fully contracted position where it produces the least amount of force. You want to challenge the muscle in the position of the range of motion where it produces the most force. So ideally, you would want a machine which makes your resistance lighter in the beginning, heaviest in the middle, lighter at the end again. Because the strength curve of most muscle groups looks like this. The resistance curve pro provides resistance linearly, like this. That's why they suck. I hate resistance bands. Does that make sense? <sighs> Um, that, no, that link, the thing scrolling at the bottom is one-on-one -on -one coaching call email. That link is for the home high intensity training workout. Um, let's see. All right. Some hard gainers become skinny fat when they try to gain weight. What could be the reason, even though they don't weigh much? Well, it's because they're not resistance training and their calorie surplus is way, way, way too high. That's why I said you want anywhere from a one to 300 calorie surplus, not a 2,000. 
So if you're getting skinny fat, then you're not adding muscle and you're only adding fat. So you're probably not resistance training or resistance training effectively and you're eating way too many calories. That's why. Or you have such ridiculously shit genetics that you're a lost cause. There are some people out there whose genetics are so bad. It just doesn't matter what they do. They're just they're just going to look normal. Mm -hmm. All right, lagging body parts. Um, you know, I can, I went over this on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash J Vincent. I went over this in depth. Um, I'm going to go through some more questions first. Um, let me see. All right, say, what do you recommend about eating around 4,000 calories a day? Dude, it depends on the individual. I mean, if you're fucking 6'5", 240, 4,000 calories a day is not the same as somebody who's 5'8", 160. <laughs> um, you did that for a month, it's all great results in weight. Yeah, you gain fat, dude. You can gain muscle. You can't, you can't gain 6 kilograms of muscle in a month. It's insane. You gain a lot of fat. The whole point... <laughs> You don't want fat gain. You want muscle gain. That's why you're doing mild calorie surplus. 4,000 calories a day is going to make you fat. And then when you go to cut that fat, you're going to lose muscle and you're just going to look worse. <clears throat> Huge delts, severely underdeveloped chest. Any tips? It's probably due to your genetics. Uh, you probably just have... I reckon... Well, did you bench press for a long time? That could be it. Um, I recommend switching to a chest fly or a chest press machine for your chest training now, and then just stop training your delts. Don't do any overhead press. Don't do any shoulder raise. Leave them. If they're developing easy, then you don't need to develop them anymore. You want to bring the chest up. So completely remove deltoid exercises altogether. And then switch to a chest fly or a machine chest press instead of a bench press. I got a belly from taking creatine. How do you get rid of a belly? No, you didn't. I'm not even, dude, that is such a dumb question. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be rude, but that's a dumb question. You did not get a belly from taking creatine. How do you get rid of a belly? Ugh. Eat less. Do you filter your water? Yes, I filter all my water. I use... One of those Brita filters, you pour it in the top and you, you put the entire thing in the fridge. I do. Um, mostly because here in Florida, the water tastes like shit. So I filter it. Does creatine speed up hair loss? Um, supposedly. Um, but you have to, yeah, that's the thing. It speeds it up. Um, you have to be genetically predisposed to hair loss for it to cause it. Um, so... Yeah, but there are there are things you can take to, you know, prevent that. Um, like hair loss people, um, there are plenty of things out there that you can take to stop that. I'm not going to re recommend it on here because it's like medicine. I can't, you know. Mm, all right, let's see. What's your most successful client story in terms of lean gains? Well, my clients only have lean gains because I don't tell them to do stupid shit. But, hmm, let's see. Well, what the, the definitely the most successful one was a guy, was a guy named Sam. He was like a year or two younger than me. So he came in at about 190 pounds, muscular. But his training approach was really stupid. He was doing all kinds of dumb stuff. You know, he was, a, he was believe it or not, he was a cross-country runner in uh, high school. So I asked him about his background to see what kind of fiber type he was, you know, predisposed to. He was a cross-country runner in high school. And I said, <laughs> I said, were you good? He goes, no, I lost. I would place dead last every race. <laughs> so I was like, well, dude, because you're not, you have no, you're not a slow twitch guy. You're a fast twitch guy based on his physique, you know, pretty big muscles. So he came in. You know, above average physique, nothing like super impressive. Uh, when I first started training him, he was recommended to me through a friend because he had all these injuries. 
and he wasn't getting very good muscle growth. So he came to me to find a way to work around his injuries and still train well because he was doing a lot of stupid shit in the gym. So within about a year, he went from 190 to 205. Friggin' jacked. And he, he admits that it was all due to the style. He trained with me just once a week. And then the other two days a week, he kind of did his own, own nonsense. He knew what he did on his own, didn't do anything. He knew that he was getting all of his gains from just training with me once a week. And he gained about 15 pounds of, of muscle in a year. But again, he had, he had good genetics. He just was not unlocking his true potential. So, yeah, he went from, you know, a little above average physique to when you see this guy, you're like, he's fucking jacked. He like, he, he really wasn't much smaller than me. <laughs> at that point. I was like a little, I mean, you know, honestly, we we're probably about the same size, same height and weight. And I, I just had better looking developed muscles, but we were about the same size at that point. My, you know, my chest was, well, no, you had a big ass chest. I bet. I mean, I was bigger than him, but he he was still jacked, and that is just training with me once a week. But again, he had he he definitely had above average genetics. Completely natural, very good on his diet. Man, I wish I had pictures of him. I can't believe I didn't. He was a very he was a very shy dude. He liked to keep to himself, so I didn't you know I didn't ask him for like before and after pictures and stuff. I you know for his privacy. But he man, he went from like. He went from like kind of normal looking to holy shit, you're jacked in just a year training once a week. Whew. Yeah, he was the most successful for sure. Again, there's the link to the at home workout updated version with more content in that one. And whoever bought this home workout, you've already been sent a link for the new updated version automatically. So be be on the lookout for that in your email. Okay, what is the best approach to expand appetite? Um, you mean increase appetite? Um, well, if you're, I mean, it depends. What do you, do, you know, why do you want to increase your appetite? You want to eat more, gain weight. Um, exercise, great way to do it. Good sleep. Um, testosterone level. I mean, really, the only the only way, if, if you are a hard gainer, and you want to add some mass, the best way to increase your appetite is train real hard. When I train, so I did my workout today, my leg workout, which was three movements. <laughs> um, I didn't even do hamstrings today because the back of my right knee, uh, my hamstring tendon is sore for some stupid reason. So I didn't do hamstrings today. I did um, leg press, leg extension and uh calf raises okay so i did my little i almost filmed it today but my the back of my hamstring was hurting so it wasn't going to look very good because i was kind of dealing with it so i didn't film it but anyway i did my leg workout today i came home and <laughs> i ate maybe almost a pound of chicken an entire um bowl of rice from the rice cooker so that's one cup uncooked which turns out to be like three cups cooked, um, a whole green pepper, some onion, and some cheese. I, like I had a plate this big because my, um, the training stimulated the appetite so bad, so much. You'll notice when you train really hard the next day. So say you train on a Monday, Tuesday, your appetite is going to be off the charts. This is a good thing. So when you notice, if you, especially if you're some a hard gainer, if you notice that your appetite is increasing, just unusually, you're like, Jesus, I'm so hungry. I can't stop eating today. That means your body's trying to grow muscle. Keep that in mind. So if you're a hard gainer and you get, are getting hungry after your workout, unusually hungry, eat like crazy. Eat tons of protein, a bunch of good unrefined carbs, and you will grow muscle. So long answer to a short question, how do you increase your appetite? Train hard. Yeah, how can you progressively overload and next static contraction exercise, increasing time result and the exercise getting too long? Well, here's the thing. If you're contracting as hard as you can. So at first you'd want to do like 30 seconds, 
50% intensity, uh, 30 seconds, 75% intensity, and then as long as you can at 100. Kind of work your way up. But after you've been doing that for a while, you can do every set just easing into the exercise and contracting as hard as you can. And the thing about time static contraction is you don't need to progressively overload it because the progressive overload is built in. If you're contracting as hard as you possibly can, as you get stronger, that doesn't allow you to contract as hard as you can longer. That amount of time is going to be pretty fixed. So say if you contract as hard as you can, it takes you 20 seconds for your legs to give out. On a time static contraction squat, it's probably always going to be 20 seconds. Because as your body gets stronger, as it builds more muscle, as it is able to contract harder, the inroad, you inroad more. It, the progressive overload is built in to a time static contraction. All right? Just contract as hard as you can. Okay, which foods did our ancestors consume? Well, our deepest, our longest ancestors are chimps. 98 point something percent of our DNA is from chimps, and they ate bugs. So if you want to eat like our ancestors, go eat bugs. I don't want to do these high-carb diets bodybuilders follow. Well, if you don't want to do high-carb, don't do high-carb. But if you are if you are a hard gainer, you're not going to see as good of results. Well, think about it. Our ancestors ate a lot of animal proteins, whether it's fish, rodents, bugs, whatever, vegetables, and some fruit. If you're trying to do the ancestral diet thing, you're just going to waste your time. It's It's stupid. You don't need to follow a bodybuilder diet, but if you're a hard gainer, you should be eating a decent amount of carbs. <laughs> Will you hunt me down and mm, me if you if I do two sets of failure? No, I recommend if you don't feel like you trashed your muscles on the first set, do another one. What I'm saying is all you need if you're training properly is one set to failure based on the majority of the research. That doesn't mean the, the world's going to end if you do too. If you get done with one set and you're like, nah, I don't know. I think I think I have more. Do another set. Not going to kill you. Uh, let's see. What do you think about hanging from a bar for forearm development? I hang with time in each workout. Two some teams the best. Really? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, that'll improve your grip strength. I mean, I wouldn't do it that way, really, because I'm heavy. But 217... Yeah, I mean, there's going to be a skill adaptation, neuromuscular adaptation to that too, but that will that will work the forearm flexors and extensors. Yes, it will. It's fine. My lower build is much more muscular than my upper body, naturally. Oh, right. If my lower build is much more muscular than my upper body, naturally. Ectomorphic upper body. Should I, should I unironically skip leg day for... Uh, no, I wouldn't skip leg day. I would just do less. Yeah, because there, there, is, there is a systemic effect to muscle growth. So if you completely ignore your legs... If you completely ignore your legs, that's going to limit how much your upper body can grow. So I would just train lower body less frequently. So say you're doing your upper body, say you're doing two workouts a week, maybe one of them include the legs, the next one only include the upper body. Just, you know, less frequency for the uh, more developed muscle group. All right, guys, I'm doing five more minutes. Get your questions in. If you want to answer it immediately, super chat me. Subscribe to my OnlyFans. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, turbo. Good job, man. like to see that. Yeah, um, let me tell you, I, I screenshot some of them. I'll post them someday, but I get messages all day. Um, of people who have seen really good results from this. And, I mean, that's my goal. 
you only limit yourself to one drink a night, would that affect you? Nope. No way. It's not enough. I mean, if you're a 95 pound girl, <laughs> but no, one drink is fine. I'm saying like, if you get to the point where you have like a buzz and you're like, you know, when you drink, you know, more than just a drink or two, you have to go, you have to pee a lot. If you're getting to that point, then you're going to have problems because it's dehydrating you. It's a, it's a diuretic. So. All right, let's see. Hard gainer with hit, uh, arms when I was doing traditional sets twice a week. Yeah, the traditional sets, you probably – see, that's the thing. If you're a hard gainer and you're doing sets the way bodybuilders do it, it's probably going to be too much for you. I've accepted the time trade-off with hit. Anything else I can do and should do to multiple sets? Um. So are you looking for a way – you want your arms bigger? Um, yeah, go ahead to clarify your question a little more. I'm not really sure what you're asking. Okay. What do you suggest for placement exercise? Leg curl extension for people who don't have access to a machine. Um, instead of a leg curl, you could do a stiff legged deadlift. Um, instead of a leg extension, just don't do a leg extension because a squat is more than enough for your quads. Uh, the addition of a leg extension probably is going to make a huge, huge difference. Um, but what you could do is a wall sit and kind of pushing. So if you do a wall sit and then just kind of push your toes forward, that'll work the quads pretty good. That's included in this workout. There's a demonstration of a wall sit specifically for the quads. Um, but, yeah, you could do a wall sit and just stiff like a deadlift. Oh, okay. Um, I am okay with the time trade-off, but arms are my – anything else to do other than just um, – you know what you could do? I mean, that's the thing. Your arms are small, but, you know, how much do you weigh? How big is your overall body? The best thing to do when it comes to smaller arms is just add mass overall. There's really nothing specific you want to do with your arms, which you could do is reduce the volume and frequency of the other muscle groups that are um, improving well. So for instance, say your biceps are small, but like, like previously, you have small biceps and your shoulders are developing nicely. Okay, well then do shoulders less. So that way you can put more intensity and recovery resources into the arms, which are... The uh, lagging muscle group. I go into this on the Patreon too. So, where's the Patreon? Eh, whatever. Yeah, I mean, if you guys have like really complicated questions, just we'll do a we can do a coaching call together. Um, we do ninety minute Zoom one on one coaching calls five at nygmail.com, and I'll give you a custom workout plan, and we'll just figure it out. Because there is some, in some, I mean, in many cases, a lot more complicated. And we have to talk for an hour and a half to figure it out. Uh, let's see. No, most frequently, all right. Now I'm going to the gym less frequently because of circumstances from attending four days to now attending two days. Compound exercise is more efficient. Yes, absolutely. Um, you're going to get way more bang for your buck. Compound exercise. Even if you... You know, say we're going, you know, more frequently. I mean, you probably don't need to go. You don't need to go four days a week anyway. You can get most of your gains out of two days a week if you do it properly. Um, but, for instance, say you were getting your best gains doing four days a week. You cut it back to two. You're going to definitely stop any loss of gains. Definitely. All right. A couple more. A couple more. Okay, so do you agree with Dr. Doug McGuff that HIP provides global metabolic conditioning are essentially all you need for all-around fitness? And the other, yeah, I completely agree with that. Um, 
because the reason, you know, in order to improve your cardiovascular system, you have to stress the muscle. Resistance training or high intensity resistance training places the most stress on the muscle, more stress on the muscle than traditional cardio. That's why cardio is easy because it places less stress and less demand on the muscle. So the more stress and the more demand you place on the muscle, the more stress and the more demand you place on the cardiovascular system. The more stress, the more demand you place on a system, the greater the adaptation. So resistance training and specifically high intensity resistance training places a huge amount of stress and demand on the muscle, which therefore places a huge amount of stress and demand on the cardiovascular system, resulting in a ridiculously good improvement in cardiovascular health. Cardio, traditional steady state locomotive bullshit, provides or, or um, places very little demand on the muscles, very little stress, very little cardiovascular adaptation. So yes, you do not need any other activity for improvements in cardiovascular health. Um, here's an anecdote. So about a year or two ago, I went to the doctors and he was listening to my lungs and taking my blood pressure and all that. And after taking all these things, he asked if I was a runner. <laughs> and I said, no. He said, are you a swimmer? I said, no. He was asking me what I did for exercise because my lungs were so clear and my blood pressure was so good that he thought I was an endurance athlete. And I told him I only do weight training one or two times a week. So Doug is right. All right, let's see. Two sets of failure is one set to failure. Two has got me closer to failure after only a month and a half of getting better. Yeah, I mean, if you feel if you feel the one set is not trashing your muscles, then do two. How can I avoid losing my sex drive when I'm around 10% body fat? You should not lose your sex drive being that low in body fat. I don't know why you think that's a phenomenon. Never heard of that. Hey, look, spam. Ow. All right, let's see. One from none. Good. Uh, yeah, I'm, there's a lot more content going on the Patreon. Uh, basically, the Patreon is a bunch of videos, pretty much similar to the YouTube videos, that don't go on YouTube. They only go on Patreon. Much more in-depth stuff. How can you tell if you're not responsive to creatine or am I going to never, you're never really going to know um, when it comes to, you know, the exercise results from creatine, but creatine is a good, uh, like health supplement. Nonetheless. <laughs> what is the worst genetics you have encountered in terms of muscle growth? Hi, bud. Um, I mean, older women are pretty bad. <laughs> uh, older women, I had one woman who was, you know, she wasn't that old. She was like 62, but she had all kinds of aches and pains. Um, then, I mean, older women aren't going to grow much muscle at all. They're going to get a lot stronger. But when it comes to men, ter men with terrible genetics for muscle growth, uh, I don't know. None of them were, I mean, none of them were that great. They're all, I don't know. <laughs> Background on fiber type. Uh, basically, what I like to ask people is the, you know, the sports that they like to do. People who generally gravitate towards sports that they're good at. And the reason they're good at them generally is because of their physiology. Uh, fiber type is one of them. You know, people who have more. I mean, there is some evidence you can kind of change fiber type, but it takes a long time. <laughs> and I'm not sure how true the evidence is. So, for instance, if you had a ton of slow twitch fiber, and you trained for 15 years using weights, you apparently they say 
uh, Dr. Andy Galpin has has some evidence that you can actually convert the slow to fast twitch, but I'm gonna have to look into that more. I don't know how true that could be. Um, but generally, you know, people with a lot of slow twitch fiber type will gravitate towards endurance type sports. People with more fast twitch will gravitate towards things like sprinting and jumping and you know, being a running back or a wide receiver or something like that. They generally be pretty fast and powerful. So that's how you know. I have an arm span of six feet. I'm six feet, but I have an arm span. Uh, no, you don't need to exercise differently at all. All right, I'm going to do one more because I'm getting tired. Hey, look, at more spam. Ooh. All right, why do you ignore? Okay. Why do you ignore sarcoplasmic hypertrophy? You can grow your arms with blood flow restriction and tiny weights. Okay. <laughs> I don't ignore sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. It just appears, based on the research, that you cannot select which kind of hypertrophy you get. You cannot increase sarcoplasmic hypertrophy without increasing myofibrillar hypertrophy and vice versa. They go hand in hand. Okay. Um, <clears throat> blood flow restriction training is stupid because you don't need to use very heavy loads to begin with. So people who, so here's the thing. If you tie a turn, the thing about blood flow restriction training too, is that you can only train a couple of muscle groups that way. You can train your calves, your quads, your forearms, and your biceps. How are you going to train your chest, your lats, your deltoids, your abdominals, your lumbar extenders? <laughs> you can't use blood flow restriction training to train those muscle groups. That's one reason why it's really fucking stupid. The second is using a tourniquet. Have you ever put on a tourniquet properly? It's really fucking painful if you put it on properly and restrict blood flow to the working tissue. All the results that could be had from blood flow restriction training could be had by simply using a moderate load in training to muscle failure. You're not, so here's the thing, even if blood flow restriction worked, what are you gonna do? Have Donkey Kong arms and an underdeveloped chest and back? It's just impractical, it's just dumb. Um, and plus, if you apply a tourniquet properly to restrict blood flow, it's gonna be so goddamn painful that you you're probably gonna it, it's just it's stupid to put yourself under that much pain if you apply it properly for maybe more muscle growth. Blood flow restriction training is just dumb. What are you gonna do? Get giant biceps and then have a small chest. You know you're really gonna tie a tourniquet around your upper thigh tight enough to restrict blood flow. Have you ever done that? So if you're doing blood flow restriction training now and you're not crying, then you're not applying the tourniquet or strap properly. Dumb bodybuilder fucking bullshit. All right. Um, that's enough for me. I got a um, minute ten, or an hour 10 here. So um, if you haven't already, go ahead, try the uh, home hit workout. Tons of exercises in there that you can do at home without a gym. Really effective. There's a new updated version of this with videos on fat loss, science of fat loss, tips for hard gainers, recovery. I don't know if you're recovered or not. Um, I'm also going to be adding additional workouts for the neck, the lumbar spine, the calves, all these things. So this workout right here, um, there's going to be plenty of updates coming in the future, just like a video game when you get updates and new stuff added. So if you get this workout, you're going to get all the updated stuff too. So just type that link in, get it there. Also, if you, you know, have a specific case, 
You want to do some one-on-one -on -one coaching and figure it out together. I do 90 minute Zoom calls and we'll figure everything out together. I'll teach you everything you need to know. So that way you can start training with a really firm understanding of the right principles and also uh, make you a custom workout plan based on what we talk about. So just email that email below if you want custom coaching. And again, like, subscribe, share the video, and I'll see you guys in a few days. Have a good holiday, Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever the hell you celebrate. Be safe. Enjoy your family. And I'll talk to you soon.